I'm just going to talk loudly. Everybody can hear me in the back, can't they? Usually not a problem. Say, so this year's 2002 Storch Award winner is Dr. Burt Davis. Um, the Storch Award was established in 1964 to recognize distinguished contributions to fundamental or engineering research on chemistry and the utilization of hydrocarbon fuels. Now this year winner is said is Dr. Davis and he's had a, had a long career which started I guess back in West Virginia where you got your BS at um, West Virginia University, Masters at St. Joseph's College, PhD in Physical Chemistry from the University of Florida, so I guess you're back in your home state. <laughs> um, followed by a postdoctoral research uh, position with uh, Paul Elliott at John Hopkins. Then he worked to work for Mobile for a while where he had got some invaluable uh, research experience in the industry, which I think translated a lot into his academic projects. Uh, taught for a while at Potomac State College in West Virginia, and then ended up in 1982 as Associate Director for Center of Applied Energy Research at the University of Kentucky where he's been, and I guess in 1998 he didn't have enough to do, so now you're director also of Catalysis Research and Testing Center, in addition to the uh, Associate Director of Applied Center Research. Now, Dr. Davis has had a, uh, developed an interesting program which combines really fundamental academic research, but cooperative research with industry. So it's been a, a, a very interesting mix. He's developed the laboratories with extensive capabilities and use of radioactive tracers and stable isotopes study reaction mechanisms. And uh, today, we are recognizing him for his creative work in really gaining fundamental mechanistic insight into complex real world problems. And really what's impressive is the creativity in his work, the breadth of his work, and also its impact in, in the area of fuel science. Now, some of the projects Dr. Davis has worked on includes direct and indirect coal liquefaction and upgrading coal liquids, mechanisms of alkane dehydrocyclization, um, structures of reforming catalysts, and I'd like to present Dr. Davis with a plaque. <laughs> Which states, American Chemical Society, the Henry H. Storch Award presented to Dr. Bertram Davis in recognition of distinguished contributions to fuel science, April 2002. Congratulations. And, and it's all looking around because here's, here's the important part, the uh, $5,000 check that also goes with the award. <laughs> the title of his seminar is very appropriate for uh, a storage award, which is fisher Coast Synthesis Mechanism. Storch was correct. Dr. Davis.
teachers I had at that time, we had to combine grades, so uh, you have the opportunity to take two grades at a time when that happened in that one. Uh, Paul Russell wrote, who I was uh, going to become a Boag teacher, but uh, a trip to a poultry packing plant on the back of a two and a half ton truck in, in December uh, convinced me that chemistry was better. <laughs>
increases from 0 to 85%. That was his view of the catalyst. Uh, this is Paul Emmett, and I'll just concentrate on the bottom, uh, where Paul Emmett points out that the catalyst changes phase, and he was using the previous slide, indicating that even though the phase is changing, activity selectivity remains pretty constant. And he took a, the viewpoint that the surface carbide sort of block the carbon, may stay on the surface, go to uh, Fisher Trump's products. I, this is our data, and it is in support of the model that Anderson was describing. Here we have pre-treated the catalyst in carbon monoxide, obtained the high activity, and obtained essentially carbide only. If we start out in synthesis gas at uh, uh, 275 pounds, we have a low activity. But if now we switch off the hydrogen, just see uh, the activity increases so that we now attain high activity. If we look at the phase, remember this is low activity here, we switch CO, get high activity. Fe304 decreases, iron carbides are formed. So that this is consistent with the model that uh, Anderson was describing, that you have to have a surface carbide. It doesn't really matter too much what that carbide layer is supported on, except what it's supported on has to be able to maintain a minimum thickness of carbide on the surface. And so, uh, in that sense, the Bureau of Mines storage model of the catalyst was correct. We still don't know what it is. Uh, this is just a rough schematic where I'm indicating much carbon at the surface layer, much oxygen at the core as you get to the steady state catalyst. So this precludes us pretty much from doing what we'd like to do, and that's say how CO is absorbed on this catalyst. Uh, so we're still limited in the structure of the catalyst that we're working with. Now, <coughs> the, the Florida pine trees got me the first time I came, and they have gotten me again or something. But Storch uh, essentially said Cracksford uh, model of carbide was <coughs> appears to be incorrect. He was being diplomatic instead of saying it was wrong. Uh, but his view was the re reaction mechanism probably involves the formation and condensation of groups containing oxygen. This was in the last page of the book on page 593 that he wrote with Robert Anderson and Norman Gulamli. And I'm probably not pronouncing her name correctly. I, apparently, Irving turned the torch around from the one I have here, or he got a different one. It's probably a younger one, but this is the picture that Robert Anderson used in his obituary. This outlines the mechanism that uh, Storch essentially with co-workers developed. The carbon monoxide absorbs, it's hydrogenated to something which is double bonded with methanol absorbed on the surface. His view is two of them. They condense, form a carbon-carbon bond. They still have oxygen. Uh, Another of these oxygen-containing monomers that adds to this, and with more and more bond formation, you get longer chain. So this is the mechanism which Storch and the group of the Bureau of Mines come to favor. Now, what we have done and what Emmett, Emmett started this uh, back in the 1950s, uh, you have the normal mechanism that would be going from absorbed carbon monoxide going to higher carbon number products. 
what we do, and in this example we're using ethanol, it's labeled with carbon-14, it absorbs on the surface, it also undergoes fischer cokes type synthesis. And so we're adding a carbon-14 labeled product, we're then looking at the products, how much comes of the carbon-14 comes with each of the carbon and from this, then deduce what happens in fischer troll synthesis and prove conclusively what happens to intermediate reactions. There's no way yet to prove that C2 red and C2 blue are identical. That has to be an assumption. But not, no assumption is involved with what happens to ethanol formed in the reaction. The secondary reaction of ethanol, the carbon-14, traces precisely, accurately, and no question, except bad experimental results. I, I just emphasize chain initiation, you have constant molar activity with increasing carbon. Any of the other simple schemes, chain propagator, uh, cooperation of isotope and non-isotope, polymerization of the atom, all cause carbon-14 to increase as you increase carbon, as you increase carbon number. The only one that stays constant is if it serves to initiate. This is some results, Emmett adding propanol and ethanol. This was done with atmospheric pressure with an iron catalyst. He got normal, uh, essentially flat carbon-14 with increasing carbon number. His conclusion was alcohol serves essentially to initiate, but does not participate any other way. Now, if you look at this, you'll see that he has data points of what are not whole carbon numbers. There's a reason for that. The only way that he could do this was to do a distillation at that time. Do carbon hydrogen analysis and arrive at an average carbon number. So this was not easy work at that time. And the accuracy of his results are amazing. This was Emmett, Keith Hall, and Cocos. These were people who worked with Emmett for a number of years. Uh, but Emmett, uh, well, you can read uh, essentially. Uh, I put this up because Emmett, to me, uh, was able to extract all of the science from the data that was there and always put an if clause where he was reaching a conclusion that someone might find not to be correct in the future. So if Emmett said it positively, it is probably accurate today. I, about 19, <clears throat> 1980, surface science instrumentation came into play. This is cover of CNE News. If this was a good picture, you can see that this is Paul Emmett's uh, CNE News. It's in his archives of the Linus Pauling and Paul Emmett archives at uh, Oregon State University, but this replaced the scorch oxygen mechanism. It was only carbene that caused fissure probes, and so CH2 polymerization was the source of the product. Now, we have shown that the alkane is certainly in or under fissure probe synthesis with iron We've put deuterium labeled octane under synthesis conditions, and there's not a detectable amount of exchange. If we put in the one olefin, and I left the double bond out there, uh, the only hydrogens exchange, and we can only measure four, and they do step ones. So that deuterium does exchange with olefin, but it's reasonably slow and it's only in the vinyl position. Whether all five exchange, we can't say, because deuterium in the fifth position is 
so low that it doesn't come out of the background. But it's conclusively shown that the octane and other, we've had another uh, alkanes are totally inert, as, even as far as exchanging hydrogen. Now with iron, the alcohol incorporate, initiates chain growth at least 80 times, and uh, since this is our part of number, this is extrapolated, greater than 100 times faster than the old. So the oxygen species is a much better initiator than olefin over the iron catalyst. The opposite is true over cobalt, but I'm just looking at iron today. Um, this is some of our data. This is a repeat of the plot you saw from M. This is from C1 through C4, uh, or C2, when we add ethanol. It is constant carbon-14 per mole. So that ethanol is doing nothing but initiating. Now, when we go to higher carbon number, we have a problem because the carbon-14 per mole is decreasing. And in the examples that I showed you, this shouldn't happen. Only increases by any of the mechanisms that we can consider reasonable. Oops, that's the wrong button. Um, if I hadn't known this, I might not have been misled by the previous data. But this is from Robert Anderson. Uh, work uh, along with Storch, uh, the two alpha plot, and that's still a uh, debate is still going on today as the reason for changing carbon number. One of the popular ones today is uh, olefin reincorporation. But uh, now we thought a long time about how can these high carbon numbers decrease, and this is the model that we came up with. I'll tell you ahead of time, the explanation is wrong, but the data is good. Uh, we could only explain the two alpha by saying this low alpha would incorporate carbon-14, that it decreases by the time we get to the higher carbon numbers, this chain growth only produces paraffins, and so this dilutes the products that we're making with carbon-14. That is true, but for a different reason that I'll show you. I, so what we were proposing is that the low alpha is oxygenate, and it produces all the products. The high alpha only produces paraffins. They dilute this, and that's what causes the decline in the carbon-14 as we go to higher carbon -14. Uh, but we also ran with one atmosphere like Emmett did. And now when we go to even high carbon number, it's constant activity. So at low pressure, we're getting what we would expect for alcohol only initiating. We go to high pressure, it doesn't. This is a fixed bed reactor. This is a slurry reactor. And it declines more rapidly in the slurry reactor. This is a schematic of how much liquid is retained in or around the catalyst. In the atmospheric fixed bed, we have a small amount of liquid holdup. We go to the higher pressure, we have more holdup. We go to the stirred tank reactor, now we have a large amount of liquid that we purposely added so that the catalyst is suspended and that we maintain. The reason that the paraffin is diluting is that the holdup of the higher molecular weight carbon products in this large volume of liquid is being synthesized and retained before we add the carbon-14 label. When we add the carbon-14 label, we make the right products. But as we go to higher carbon number, they are diluted. The lower products come through essentially a gas phase, no, uh, no hold up, and they're not blue. So they agree with it initiating. The others do not. And so our initial explanation was wrong. But now we went back and ran another run in which we've collected the carbon number up through C22. The para 
If, however, we look at the olefins, we get a constant carbon number. A constant carbon 14 with increasing carbon number. The reason for this is the initial CO goes to an intermediate product, which in this case is the olefin. But the olefins, by staying in the reactor, are hydrogenated to paraffins, which, as you go to higher carbon numbers, stay in the reactor longer. And so the olefins are what we should be looking at for the mechanistic consideration. And it does agree with the atmospheric results in up to C30. And so the reactor disguise is our reason for our initial explanation of two different sites. I, we're not the only one. Uh, if you're going to be wrong, you should show someone else's also. Uh, this one was done where they're using uh, carbon-13 labeled ethylene with CO. But they're putting in pulses of the ethylene, and so they're doing synthesis continuously with unlabeled. And then they collect the product during, let's say, the whole 30 minutes. The data that they get is like this. They explain this by saying if you go to higher carbon number, you have less carbon 13 relative to carbon 12. And so that's why it decreases. But our conclusion was that you should only look at the uh, C2 and higher carbon 13 products. And when you do this, the corrected data fit very well that the ethylene is serving to initiate chain growth and not the mechanism that uh, these authors who I won't name is using. Uh, another example of what you can do with carbon 14 <coughs> tracers is shown here. If you look at the products coming from the reactor and plot the alkane over the alkene plus alkene for carbon number, it's not constant. We have added the carbon number olefin labeled with carbon-14 indicated by the arrow. Uh, C2 is mostly alkene at low alpha catalyst because it can compete with CO absorbent dehydrogenate. And so this is secondary hydrogenation that makes high alkene product in this. On this side, the olefin is retained for a longer time in the reactor, and so it undergoes secondary hydrogenation, not because of absorption, but because of vapor liquid equilibrium and retention in the reactor. And so we reached the conclusion that in this region is typical of what you should get from initial product. And so with this iron catalyst, roughly 15% of the product, initial product is paraffin at most. Another bit of data in support, at least as we use it for the oxygenate mechanism, and that Storch was correct, is comparing using labeled alcohols the ISO and the normal alcohol. Now, what Emma found and what we found are in agreement, and they show that if you put in the normal alcohol, it produces predominantly normal products labeled. If, on the other hand, you put in the ISO alcohol, this one produces more of the ISO product than the normal product. So if you have the alcohol, in this case isopropanol, normal and isopropanol, uh, if they go to the olefin, they have the same thing, and so they should make the same product. So we would rule out the alcohol initiating by going to the olefin, which is what does it. If you say, okay, you lose the oxygen on the surface, you get what is equivalent to the half hydrogenated state from the twig hydrogenation mechanism. We've shown that these olefins exchange deuterium. So therefore, if you form
form the even the monoliths or C3 olefin and like material, it should equilibrate so that it's absorbed at the second and at the first carbon, and you should get the same product. The only way we can see to explain getting different distribution of products from the normal alcohol and the iso alcohol, or at least the easiest one, is say oxygen remains attached until you go to the next step, have added the carbon. Indirect support, but still support for oxygen. This is just shows some of our data. This is isoparaffin where we're adding the iso alcohol. Uh, that the paraffins decrease. These are the higher carbon number because of the accumulated paraffin, but almost uh, that they're significantly more since we're plotting the law. Uh, carbon 14 in the iso paraffin from the iso alcohol and in the same part of the normal current. And this has been consistent now with both Emmett and us. And so we would say that this doesn't occur because of the, the, that, uh, the only way you can get this is for this not to occur unless you retain the oxygen. And we've shown that this does occur because of deuterium exchange in the old Another indirect for retention, and this really should be C5, there's one too many carbons here, but the important is just let's look at the CO2. When we have the carbon in the one position, we get a lot of carbon 14 labeled CO2. We don't get a detectable amount of labeled CO. Now, the way that you would like to say that you get CO2 is it comes from the alcohol undergoing the reverse hydro uh, carbonylation reaction. So that you lose hydrogen, you extrude CO, this undergoes water gas shift and forms CO2. The fact that you get much higher carbon 14 in the CO2 when the, is here than you have in the CO says. It can't be formed by the secondary water gas shift. CO2 has to be forming directly from the alcohol. Now, in order to prove this, we go back and put carbon-14 in this position. When we do it, we get no carbon-14 in the CO2 or in the CO2. And we do get carbon-14 in higher products. So the only way that we can see to get rid of, and when Leslie scanned this uh, transparency to make the overheads, she sort of got this one reversed, so this is the mirror image, and this is really CO2, not a new compound. <laughs> um, but that we're going to something that resembles an absorbed acid. Now, when you're doing fissure trough synthesis, there certainly is oxygen around on the surface. And so to form such a material, uh, absorbed species is possible, we think. And it could then decarboxylate to give you a C4 species, which is unlabeled when you do the uh, pentanol and the CO2 is labeled. We cannot go to CO because this has less label than the CO2, and you can't form CO2 from the CO and have more carbon 14. Again, indirect, but in support of the uh, mechanism that I show here, where you're going from the alcohol to an acid like structure that then eliminates CO2. One of the very surprising things is shown here. What we have done is add carbon 14 labeled CO2 with unlabeled CO. Now, this is the activity of CO2 exiting the reactor. This is the activity of CO exiting the reactor. If that CO absorbs on the surface, initiates chain growth, and propagation, 
then the most activity you can have is shown by the green curve. If you have this much activity in C1, then you can double it for C2. You can't make it any higher. And so the maximum activity we should see with partner number is this. That's not what we say. Much more carbon 14. So that the only way that we're able to explain this is that the small amount of CO2 that is absorbing and participating is serving to initiate chain growth. And it initiates, and then the monomer that makes our carbon number essentially comes from CO. So the only way we have been able so far to explain this is the initiating species is unique to the monomer that then does subsequent chamber. Now this one was run at the port and the technician at Soup Chem A moved the decimal point over one place and put in 12% copper instead of 1.2. So as soon as I show this and mention the composition of the catalyst, People jump up and fight to get to say the reason for this is water gas shift and that it comes from the copper. So we go back and make a catalyst similar amount of potassium but no copper. There's more scattered than we would like, but this is the activity of CO2, of CO, and again, more. Activity in the products that we can account for from the CO. But knowing someone would still say more gas shift, we go back and do it with iron. And this has no promoter, nothing but iron converted iron carbide. CO2, much less water gas shift, so the CO2 has a much higher activity than with the ones that do have water gas shift activity. But still, much more activity than we can account for from CO. And so the only way that we've been able to explain this is that an intermediate is formed from CO2 that resembles the intermediate in water gas shift, that this is what is responsible for chain initiation. And once you get this chain initiation structure, then the CO is the monomer that causes the rest of the chain growth. Now, when you're proposing some strange mechanism such as the adsorbed acid, uh, and you look in the literature to find that someone's done this before, so you can blame them for being the first to propose it. And we find the infrared data that Weihelder did on an iron, uh, when he adsorbed uh, alcohol, uh, he got a structure which was consistent with carboxylate. I even go back, Cobell in one of uh, his papers proposed an acid-like structure. So we think the oxygenate mechanism that uh, Storch initially came up with 50 years ago is still a valid mechanism. We think there's improvements that the tracer has added to it that what initiates is different. Whether it's this structure or not, we don't know. But that oxygen stays with the growing chain until it terminates. That is the only way that we can account for all of these. I finish with something that is attributed to Robert Anderson that the diesel engine will eventually save pressure troubles. Uh, we hope that's true. Uh, at least there's indication now that interest is renewed, and it is because of diesel. And acknowledge USDOE. I should mention Gary Steigman, especially since Gary was a unique uh, person. Uh, the first meeting we had with him after showing him about two hours of slides, and, and I still had two more hours, and he says, enough. Uh, first thing he got to do is prove to me that he can run a reactor. Uh, fortunately, round robin, and the reason I invite Rocco was he insisted we be the one to test all of the catalysts. Uh, the other groups then got the same result we did, and 
so Gary accepted that we could run the reactors. And the Commonwealth of Kentucky, which has supported this center now for 25 years. And you for staying here this long and listening to me, trying to convince you that Scorch was really correct. Thank you. 